Jace. How have you been, mate? Yeah, good, mate. Thank you. Yeah. Um, busy, busy, busy pre-season underway at the moment for the academy and, and the scholarship. So, um, you know, we're, we're just coming to the back end of it now. It's been a long old pre-season. It started, started in the first week in November and it's still going strong now. So we've got some games coming up early March. So we're ready. We're ready to get going. So it's it is a fair pre-season, really, mate, at that level, then, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, what is it? Four months. It's a long, it's a long time. I think the players are ready to start playing some games now. There's only so much stimulation you can get from training, and um, you know the end product for a rugby player is to play some games. So you know they're they're about ready to go now. Good stuff, mate. So before we get stuck into your rugby story, Jason, where was home for you, and who lived at home with you as a kid? Uh, home for me was. Was in Hull, was down um, at what a place called Hezel Road uh, in the west of Hull, which is a big, big, big um, fishing community. Trawlerman. Uh, my dad was a trawlerman. Uncle, all the all the males really in our in our family was was fishermen, and and you know that was the community that we had down Hezel Road. It was um, you know down to earth, working class people who who grafted and. Uh, like to drink and you know was from the area where the males went out and, and did that hard job and the females stayed at home and looked after the kids so uh, there was myself there was my mum and dad um, I had my brother and my sister as well so there was it's a fairly full house we lived about 100 maybe 150 metres away from the boulevard uh, Hull FC's old ground so I used to go down there and watch some games when I was a kid so how was the competitiveness in your house as a kid then with having a brother and a sister? How was that? Yeah, it was. I mean, it, we're fairly close. I think there's two years between me and my younger sister and then there was another two years between me and my, my youngest brother. So, um, so it, was, it was competitive. You know, He was a live wire as well, my, my younger brother. So uh, we was always sporty. It, it was the era where you, you came home from school, you dropped your school bag and you was out. Uh, you came yeah. on, you know, when the street lights came on. Um, you know, that's just, you know, that's what we did. We played with friends and we went and played, you know, had block or whatever it was called, or football or rugby yeah. on, the, on the gardens and on the streets and played a few other games that you're probably getting a bit of trouble for now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, back then, it's just what it's what you did. It's what we did to keep ourselves yeah. busy. We didn't, we didn't have no money, so there was no... There was no video games, there was no Xboxes and all the stuff that they got now. It was entertain yourselves, you know, get outside. It was. Everyone was like that, though, Jace. Everyone was in the sort of same boat, weren't they? And... <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I'd love to do it now. Honestly, the, yeah. the kids nowadays, they're so sheltered. It's completely opposite now. You come home and you don't come out your bedroom. Um, Scurdy, really, mate, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, think, I think the... I think the world has changed so dramatically, not for the better, for the worse. Yeah. I, I talk personally now, I, I wouldn't let my kids out now because I'd be scared of the people and the things that are around. Yeah. Um, getting kidnapped and all the rest of the stuff that goes with that, you know, that, that would frighten the life out of me. And it probably happened back then, but you just never knew about it because there was no social media. Something happens now and it's gone around the world in, in 20 minutes. Hundred um, percent, yeah. It's good, but it's it's not so good as well because I think it's turned us all into into scaredy cats. Yeah, I know you wouldn't go in for your tea if your mum shouted you, mate. Weren't all back out then, was you? That was it. Was drop your bag. <laughs> you came on for your tea. Yeah, you, you know, you went back out and, and just come on when it gets dark, and that was it. And don't, your mum has give you some boundaries not to go past. Don't go, don't go past. You know, wherever. Wherever she'd give you, and, that, and you never, uh, but you didn't need to because she was wee mates and he was doing what young kids do. It was brilliant. That's it, mate. So you touched on the boulevard, really. So I imagine it was pretty early, but how was you introduced to rugby and, and where was your first junior club? Uh, started when I was about 10. Same story as, as most people. You know, my friends was playing, asked me to go along training, went training, loved it instantly and uh, got to take out 
some aggression and some energy and have a good time with your mates and you know be young kids um i remember playing my first strangely because it's so long ago i remember playing my first game and i got i got stood cut right across my knee and it was probably about six inches long not deep but it was a decent cut like and i've still got the, i've still got the scar now and, but i just remember and i, and I, I don't know why I, I just loved it it was like yeah there you go you know we were so in from the off mate yeah that was it and yeah. because again because i because of where i lived i'd seen the crowds flocking to and from boulevard to rugby all the time and my dad was a big rugby fan and Again, a family of rugby fans. My dad used to play back in the uh, in the sixties and seventies, and he was a he was a very good amateur player. Um, yeah. But he got he could have been professional. Everyone tells me all the time how good he was. Um, but I think he he got into drinking women, um, decided against that kind of career path, and went on the on the ships instead. So it was always in the family. It was always around the friends and. And you know, once I got into it, I never stopped. Was you told that from a young age, Jess? Was it ever any pressure on you how good your dad was, or was you just allowed to go and play? No, no, there wasn't. No, 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 there was no pressure. I was allowed to play. Uh, my dad didn't come and watch me that often because he he was at sea. So yeah. how they used to do it back then it was you would get one day off for every week he was away. So he'd go away for a month at a time, and he'd only be home for four days, and that you know that could be midweek or. Uh, I'd go away for six weeks and be home for six days. It was just how it was. And so he never got to see many games. So he never put, he wasn't one of them dads who would stand on the sideline and give me any kind of feedback, really. My mum was the get off his head or run it gate. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, he's typical mother, like you don't really, you don't really, you'll be able to tell you what she says with a pinch of salt. Um, but yeah, there was, there was no, there was no pressure. People now even tell me, Oh, was you Bob? Are you Bob's son? Oh God, he was a good player, you know. Um, so yeah, he could have he could have been a, a good one, I think. But like I said, he chose the he chose alcohol and he chose fishing. And... He's chased on it; doesn't always go the way, the way it maybe should or whatever. It's just how it works, mate. Yeah, again, it was a generational thing for him. Yeah. His dad being a fisherman and. All his friends going into into the trawlers, so it was just a, it was just a progression for him and the natural path. It was something I toyed with for a small time, but my mum would never let me go. Um, I was going to go when I was sixteen. You, they kind of snuck you aboard some people, um, and my dad was going to do that, but my mother would she, she wouldn't have it. She said she said I can deal with one of you dying, but I can't have you both. <laughs> so it was uh, oh, yeah. The most scary times, mate. We like right, us younger ones don't really understand that, do we? No, like the pits, the trawl, and that sort of things. Like phased yeah. out, hasn't it? Dangerous, dangerous jobs. I mean, obviously, coming from Hull, I, I hear all the stories about the, the trawlers that went down in the in the bad weather, like the Gaul. You hear about the Gaul and um, plenty of other ships that went down. And uh, I used to go and. Um, Pick my dad up from the docks and sometimes we'd go to Grimsby and we'd sail from Grimsby to Hull and they'd let me on the ship and even then just coming down the river Humber it'd be, it'd be moving around a bit it'd be a bit scary for me so uh, I remember <clears throat> excuse me I remember um, I remember one time my dad's friend died on the ship uh, he he one of the wires snapped and it was all steel wires back then and yeah uh, one of the wires snapped and he took his head off took his head clean off yeah um, so obviously he's died instantly. And I remember my dad was the one that had to pick his head up and put it in a bag and it traumatised him for quite a while. My dad had to retire. Yeah. He, he, him himself, he trapped his he trapped his arm in one of the winch doors at the back and they weigh about four tonne. Yeah. So he got his arm trapped in, in the winch and uh, he, he, he couldn't use his arm anymore. He had it, he, they managed to patch it up and did skin grafts and stuff, but he never got the use of his arm again. So it was a, it was a dangerous old job. Yeah, and there was none of the uh, mental health stuff then, mate, was there? He probably just yeah. expected to get on with it after after like, oh, yeah. his mate and that. There was there was big tough men, weren't they? It was you know, it was man yeah. up, you know, get over it and get back out there. And um yeah, I, I remember I mean there was tough fellas, there was tough blokes. Yeah. Uh, I think they used to have a few scraps. I remember 
again, a few times my dad would come home and we'd pick him up on the side of the dock and he'd have a black eye or two. And I think they'd had a bit of a crack at the, at, at the sea. That's just what <laughs> it's meant, yeah. put meant together in a small area. Um, and it had been a straight then as well, which is unfamiliar now, isn't it? And, yeah. Yeah, 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 I think they had a few straighteners, and but but again, men back then, you just shook hands and it was gone. Oh, yeah, gone with it. Yeah, yeah, tough so, time. But yeah, it was. It was very different, but probably much for the better. Like we've said, mate, wasn't it? Like if you were cheeky to someone in the street, you got a clip, didn't you? And yeah. people left the front doors open because they knew everyone, and yeah. no one had much more than anyone else. It was just the music was good as well, mate, wasn't it? And everything <laughs> was good back then. It was for you uh, guys over that way, yeah. Yeah, you know, it was good music. My mum and dad, massive Beatles fan. My mum comes to Liverpool all the time. She goes about four or five times a year. She she loves it there. Good stuff, mate. So was there any rep stuff, like town team stuff for you, JC? 11 or 12, around that age? Yeah, again, it was different. It was different then to what it is now. So we had, it was Humberside then. It's, Humberside's no more, but we had... Um, you had Humberside under 12s and 13s, 14s, etc. And then you also had a, it was a strong schools league back then. So I played for whole schools. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I would go back to that now if I could. I think they got rid of it partly because, again, the world's changed, but they didn't want to, um, they didn't want representative rugby at under 12s and 13s and 14s because. It should be all inclusive for every player. Um, but again, back then it was, so you would get picked for whole schools. You play for your school, you get selected for whole schools, you'd then play in a league against Leeds schools and Cass schools and Huddersfield and whoever. And then from that, the selectors would pick a Yorkshire schools. You'd play like a tri-series against, uh, against Cumbria and Lancashire. And then from that, you got picked for England schools and you'd play against France. Um, we played we played uh, against France for England schools under 16s. Um, I think it was the week before the Knox Central Park down when Wigan moved. So that's uh, that's my claim to fame. It's a good fact. Uh, yeah, probably the last game then, eh? Yeah, we would have... Well, we played, we played before Wigan played St. Helens. Um, right. in the derby so there was 20 odd thousand there at Central Park it was amazing absolutely amazing yeah good so, times mate like, again good time yeah so like you said you'd have that back I, I didn't understand why they got rid of obviously it takes people like yourselves to tell us but was was that something you'd, you'd aspire to do anyway Would did you ever get like not back at a young age and if you didn't how, how do you think you might have took that uh, no, I was uh, I was fairly lucky in that I had quite a I had quite a good amateur career. I was I was in I was older. I was born in October, so I was one of the bigger ones in the year group. Mm. Um, so I wouldn't say it was easy, but I was one of the better players. Uh, you know, if I'd have been born August time, it might have been different. But for me back then, it was. It was fairly linear to the to the top kind of thing, but it was never it, strangely it was never something I aspired to do. I, being a professional, I didn't I didn't dream of being a professional. Not until I was about thirteen, fourteen, but maybe even all maybe fourteen, fifteen. I, it was just I just did it. I did it because I enjoyed being with my mates and I loved the game and it was it was good to get out and train on the night and Saturday mornings and. And play on a Sunday, give something to do on a weekend, and focus. And I just enjoyed it. And then some things started coming my way, you know. And then, um, and then I started to think, you know, what I, I want to do is I want to I want to do this as a job. So, what were you like in the uh, the trial sort of setup, mate? Was you someone that was quite comfortable in that? Because there is a little bit of pressure there, Jason. That's so always you comfortable in the trial sort of period of things, or no, so what? I would no. I never had much self confidence. Um, how it happened for me was, we was playing for whole schools against Leeds, and Dean Bell was the academy coach at Leeds, 
And I'd already been to Hull, Hull Sharks, there was back then, and Hull KR. Yeah. And they, you know, they was interested. They wanted us to go there. And then we we did we got invited by Leeds Rhinos to go for a training weekend there. Um, and it was a full weekend, so that you went down on the Friday, you went over to Leeds on the Friday, you watched their Super League game. I think it was against Castleford. Yeah. You stayed over Friday night. Then on the Saturday, you went to the it's Leeds Beckett University now. You went there, you had a full day's training. There was there was 30 of us. Um, you did some lectures on the night time, and then on the Sunday you trained again, and then on the Sunday afternoon you had a game. It was like a trial game. And then they selected who they wanted from that. And in the teams that 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 era, that year group, there was there was myself, but then there was the pretty much all the golden generation of kids that lead. So there was there was Danny, Danny Maguire, there was um there was Rob. Burrow, um, there was uh, Ryan Bailey, there was Chev Walker. It was a it was an outstanding group. Uh, Danny Bruff was on that trial. Kirk Yeeman was on that trial from Hull FC. Ended up going to Hull FC. So there was Jamie Langley, I think, was there. It was a really, really, you know, it was a really good year group, that year group. And I remember I got man of the match in the game. I, I, you know, I didn't even think I'd play that well. Anyway, but Dean Dean and, and Bob Pickles, the head scout, came over to my mum after the game and just said, Can we can we meet up with you next week? Um, talk to you about signing Jay. So that that was how it took off from Leeds. Um they came over to Hull the following week and we met up with them. It was, there was only one place I was gonna go when they asked me to go there. It was Leeds. Yeah. I can imagine it's some experience for a young lad as well, and it? it's it's because it, it's quite a, it's a serious thing when you get like you said to 14, 15, that's when it becomes about predominantly winning, and then yeah. it becomes about being better than your opposite man, sort of say, doesn't it, mate? Then at that age, and when the scouts coming and stuff, it was it 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 really was, and and without being disrespectful disrespectful to all I've seen all KR at that time, there was nowhere near where Leeds Rhinos was. Leeds have always been the glamour club, haven't they? They've always been like the yeah. big rich club. And um and Dean Bell is just a legend of the sport. Like if Dean Bell knows your name, you you you're winning already. So yeah. um you know for him to come over, shake my hand and call me Jason was just like, oh my God, you know, this is a rugby league God, the stuff that he won at Wigan. You know, and and as a New Zealand captain was just phenomenal. So, just to have them people know I was 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 enough. If even if they didn't yeah. want to sign me, and they just knew my name, that I would have won. Um, but the fact they wanted me to go and join Leeds was was just uh, unreal. Uh, there was myself and there was my best mate at the time, Glenn Donkin, and so we we'd sign there. And, you know, kids kids now want so much and and. Back then, this, I signed a contract and I was getting paid two and a half thousand pound a year. That's that was the contract, two and a half thousand, and then it went up to three thousand. Out of that two and a half thousand, I had to get the train to Leeds four times a week, and it was eighteen pound a return. So yeah. it ended up costing my mother money for me to go and play for Leeds. She was scratching around trying to find money back end of the week to afford me to be able to go to Leeds and train. You know, when I hear stories now and deal with kids who who, who kind of scoff at, at more money than that, I just think, wow, you know, you don't really want it enough. Yeah, that, that was an inspiration to me. I, I want to be a professional now. I, I'm going to bust my ass, and I'm, we had to travel. My day started at seven. Woke up, went to college. Excuse me, uh, went to college, finished college, walked all the way from. Well, it would have been. a about a three mile walk to the train station, jumped the train to Leeds, got another train from Leeds train station to the training ground. So two trains, um, we'd get a lift back to the train station. We'd get home at 10 to 10. My, my mate's mother would pick us up. Sorry, 10 to 11. The train was at 10 to 10. We'd get home at 10 to 11. My mate's mother would pick us up, take me home in the car. I'd be home for just after 11. And I'd go to sleep, and I did that four days a week, from being out out my house from eight o'clock till eleven. 
just because I want to be professional. Like, you know, I'm going to do what I can. I'm not going to die wondering. Um, and, and I was netless and I was never, ever uh, skillful, you know, talented player, but I grafted my tits off. And I think that's probably where that work ethic came from. Yeah, you work to... right about shine, talent won't it, if the talent doesn't work, sort of thing. That's the, that's the, the saying, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Talent will get you in the room, but effort will keep you in. Um, yeah. No, sorry, talent will get you through the door, effort will keep you in the room, like... Yeah. And I, I was an effort-based player always. I didn't. I couldn't pass or cut. Well, I couldn't pass. I couldn't kick. I wasn't particularly fast, but I'd bust my ass every day for you. And I had to. Yeah. I had to. If I didn't, I wouldn't have been in the team. Yeah. And if you do your bit nowadays, mate, the money will come, won't it? You've just got to earn the right first, as as you do on the field for a for a win, isn't it? You have to earn the right. Yeah, that was it. It was. It was get paid nothing now, but live the dream as a Super League player and you get more money. I did three years of um, three years of earning no money whatsoever and, and my mother having to pay for me, bless her. I had to I had to stay at college, force me to stay at college, hated it. But I had to stay at college yeah. just so she would continue to get a family allowance. That's how tight yeah. it was. So she would get that extra money so we can afford to, for me to go and get my train. Um and then I did that for three years, and then they asked. That, then I got offered a five-year contract at Leeds, which is just fun, fantastic. Yeah, and I was getting paid. I went from like three thousand to fifteen thousand, and then it went up to eighteen. And I was only eighteen yeah. years old, and it was like, oh my god! That was when I got a bit silly and started buying Versace <laughs> shirts and stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> But for uh, for a little time there, it was, it was just hard work, mate. It was just it was yeah. you had to sacrifice everything, you know. And, and it's what I tell the players nowadays when I deal with them: is don't die wondering, don't walk away knowing that you could have done more. Yeah. Even if you don't get to be a full time professional, you don't get to live the dream of being a Super League player. As long as you've tried your hardest, that is literally all you can do. That is all you can do. Don't. Don't walk away and look in the mirror and think, I should have done more, I could have done more. Yeah, no, 100%, mate. So if we if we just rewind a little bit, mate, how did you find the transition into senior school then? Was, did you reckon the rugby out with that? Uh, yeah, I was a little shit in school. Was um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I was I was Funnily enough, I, I was speaking to... My old teacher, I saw my old teacher today from high school, um, today of all days, and yeah. she's saying he was, he was a little sod at school. <laughs> and, uh, I said, oh, I, wasn't, I wasn't that bad. She said, he was a lovable rogue. And I thought, yeah, I'll take that title. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, uh, again, I, I probably treat school as, like I treat rugby. It was a chance to be with my mates and have a bit of a laugh and a giggle. I was never educational. I was intelligent, very intelligent, but I wasn't bothered. Uh, Your partner just wasn't for you, mate. No, I just I, I didn't aspire to go to college or university or uh, again. I was a I was fisherman's son. Like yeah, you know, my no one in my family did anything more than you know working jobs, like manual jobs. So it just wasn't something that I aspired to do. So. I didn't probably put in as much effort as I should have done. And then and then I signed a contract at Leeds when I was 15. And then I got, I didn't, I won't say I got arrogant, but I knew, I knew then in my head that I was going to be a Super League player. I just didn't, I was so tunnel visioned into, into doing that, that there was never any, anything that was ever going to stop me from doing it. So when it came to exams and things, I just didn't, I didn't put as much effort in as I should have done. I wish I had. I didn't. Yeah. 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 So what what was the standard of school rugby like, mate, compared to club rugby? Uh, it wasn't it wasn't as, as good as club rugby because in club rugby the best players kind of congregate to a certain club or a certain team. Whereas mm-hmm. school rugby obviously it depends where you are in the city. So the talent is kind of more spread out and um 
the the players who don't normally play the game would would have a game because just because they fancied it. So yeah. all the, the standard... in where you didn't have people and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the standard of school rugby wasn't as wasn't as high, but again, it was just playing rugby. You got you you got you. Mm-hmm. Got your hands on the ball and got to play rugby with your mates, and this time with your schoolmates who you don't see on a weekend. So I loved it. Any any game was was a good game in my opinion. Yeah, and the union when you were growing up, mate. No, no, no. Uh, rugby union in Hull has got stronger over the over the last few years, but uh, back then it was it was again it was working class. It was all rugby league. Even football wasn't right. big in Hull then. Uh, it was yeah. it was Hull FC and Hull KR, and you know Hull City played at Bowfrey Park, and there was in Division Three or Four. Like there was, there was nowhere near as as big as what it is now. I think five, six, seven years ago, the RFU came into Hull and spent some money and, and tried to you know lift the game up here. But before that, yeah. there was there was there was no rugby union now. Yeah, and. Just touching on that with you saying that, how was that for catchment at Tavern? Which we'll talk about your role a little bit later on, what you're in now, but did that cause a bit of competition for you when the RFU come up or was you quite content with the fact that you were the number one pull in, in Hull, really? No, it didn't. It didn't because uh, here anyway, it's still very tribal. It's still, it's still very... Well, FC, okay. There's a few clubs that have come in from outside, but they're all rugby league. Rugby union. We find a lot of rugby union players now play rugby league as well. Um, we get that school. here as well. Yeah, we encourage it. We encourage it. We've got some lads who we've had on our scholarships who, who've told us they the play. I can't remember the, what they, they call it. The ED. Oh, the audience. Yeah, and, and we just say, go on, play it. Play as many sports as you can. When it comes to getting paid and being an academy player, then you'll have to make a decision. But whilst you're at school, go and play as many sports as you possibly can. We'll support that absolutely. Um, and you so yeah, there's never there's never really been any issue. Plus, overall, mate, it's only got to enhance the, the ability, isn't it? Ball yeah. handling techniques, coordinations, all that type of thing. There's so many transferable skills. Yeah, so many. Whilst I don't, I don't like rugby union. I, I find it quite boring. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. There's a hell of a lot of, of technical skill in the sport. You know, it's rugby league's very um, gladiatorial, very physical. Whereas rugby union is a lot more technical, and I, I completely understand that. And I respect it, and, and I like the the catch pass in rugby union is getting a lot better and. Um, I like the tackle really technique in rugby union. Yeah, yeah, there is now. Yeah. There's getting more and more influence of rugby league um, in regards to structures and things because rugby league defences have to be very structured because it's so open. Yeah. Um, now, but you know the the rugby union players. I wish there'd be a few more that'd come over to the sport. Obviously, money plays a big part in that, but. I think there's some very skillful players in rugby. I'd love to have seen Johnny Wilkinson in a in a rugby league shirt. I really would. I think he he would have made it in rugby league. He was a tough kid. Um, yeah, I, that kind of era for rugby union is the only era that I've really watched England and and paid any attention to it. That's fair enough, mate. That's fair enough. So when when you you're growing up, mate, and you're looking at playing the rugby league, are you mate having to make the sacrifices that kids don't quite understand now and do you get frustrated with that a little bit or are you noticing a more professional outlook on life from the youngsters now? Uh, uh, the group that we've got now are, are very um, dedicated. So I think, anyway, I mean, I don't see them every day and every night, but the sacrifice I had to make back then and, you know, was was the things like, you know, your nights out and that. People would go on a Saturday night a game on a Sunday, or um, you know, hanging on the street corners with your mates back then, and and drinking the cheap cider. Uh, I'd only have one bottle instead of two. <laughs> 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 but, 
No, you, look, but like I said, I didn't. I wasn't getting home till eleven o'clock most nights, so the, the, there was no way I could have done anything anyway. Yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't a saint, not by not by any stretch of the imagination. I still had a night out when the time was right to out, but I understood when that was. And I think the lads nowadays, the ones we've got anyway, are, are very much the same. I I encourage them if they're over eighteen anyway. I encourage them to go out and be with their friends and. You have to switch off. I, I don't think you can live and breathe the game twenty four seven. You have to be a young lad. You have to, you know, spend time with your mates and your family and your, your girlfriends and whatever else they've got. So I encourage it, but understand what the end goal is for you. You can spend the rest of your life going on nights out. <clears throat> so when signing for Leeds come about, mate, how does? How does that process work? So did they come to your house when you agreed the deal? And, and and what does signing for a pro club entail? So you mentioned a little bit about the train journeys and stuff, mate. So a little, add a little bit more to that, if you don't mind, about the people and the culture that the train drive then. Was it a little bit more professional than others at the time, with them being Ooh. such a big club? Yeah, Leeds was and always have been so professional and so well run and managed. In certainly in the time since I was there and now, um, like I said, after the after the game the, on the weekend, they came over to to Hull. They didn't come to my house. We met them in a hotel. Um, it was Dean Bell and Bob Pickles, who was who was there, who was their chief scout back then. Really nice fellow was Bob, and basically said, I think it was five hundred pounds signing on fee, and two and a half grand a year, I think it was, or two thousand a year. Two good two and a half grand. And that that was amazing. Again, I got 500 quid, 500 quid in my pocket. Me and my mate and best mate Glenn, who signed as well. We went out and bought mobile phones, which we was the first people in our in our high school to get mobile phones. Yeah. Um I remember it was a big, big fat Motorola phone. Uh and I don't know why we bought them because none of our mates had mobile phones, so we could only <laughs> ring each other. Um <laughs> So yeah, so we went did you buy past the page? You did you, Jason? Went straight to the mobile. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we was big time, man. We had five hundred quid in our pocket. <laughs> uh, it was before you couldn't even send text messages. It was before text messages and all. So it was. I don't know why we got them, but yeah. That, so we signed there, and then you know, we went. We'd go and train at Leeds, and they trained at a place called Tetley's. I'm assuming Tetley owned it. Tetley's bitter. Uh, it you know it, it was it was ultra professional. It was you know, Kevin Sinfield was in the squad and Jamie Jones Buchanan, uh, yeah. Gareth Carvel, all that that era of player, as well as the ones I'd mentioned earlier that was just starting. You could see there was something special at the club. Leeds had won the academy league, I think, the previous three years. Um, and we went on to win it for the next three, four years as well. You know, we was we was the pinnacle at, at that age. Um, we had some tussles, some good tussles with Wigan. Wigan had some good players as well. So they had players like Sean O'Loughlin playing for them. Uh, Gareth Hock came through. Sean Briscoe. Um, Billy Joe Edwards, who was Sean Edwards' brother, who unfortunately died when he was fairly young. He played there. Uh, they had... You know they had a very good team, so we had some good tussles. But by and large, Leeds Leeds always came out on top. I think we was unbeaten at home for about three years. Um, and luckily for me, I wasn't playing in the game. I was injured in the game where we got beat by Castleford to break the record. But yeah, it was just it was ultra professional, which is what I loved. I loved because the standards were so high, you had to. You had to meet them, or otherwise you'd get found out. And so it was a it was a challenge, you know. You, when you're training and playing with the likes of Kevin Sinfield, you you have to meet that challenge. You have to be at that standard. Um, and there was many many players, more talented players than me, who who didn't because of you know various things didn't meet that challenge and you didn't just didn't make it, didn't get through the end. And then sort of mentions that we touched on before, Jace, isn't it? It's all about the effort markers that people look for, the talent to follow the effort, won't it? Yeah, well, and 
some I met some some brilliant people there, brilliant people um, who I still speak to, I still speak to now, I still speak to Rob fairly regularly. Um, I see Danny obviously is what is working at all KR now. So uh, I'm in the I'm in the Leeds Rhinos ex players WhatsApp group. So that you know they're all in there. I don't really say much because some of them led some of them are absolute legends of the sport. So I don't I don't, <laughs> sit back I don't say a word. <laughs> I just sit back and go, wow, well, I'm in a WhatsApp group with Adrian Morley. <laughs> yeah. So how did you carry on with competing for success? Because a lot of teams maybe sit on models, but the how do you go against letting complacency creep in, or is it them type of characters that drill it into you that you can't stack mates sort of thing. Yeah, it, it was the it was the players around you and the people around you. Even when Dean Bell left and and the next coach came in, Mick Cook or Stuart Wilkinson, even when the head coaches would leave the club, that the club ethos was like you're going to graft hard and you're going to work hard. And there's no coincidence that Leeds had the success that they had for so long with that group of players that came through. There's no, it's, it, you know, it's not by accident. They drove the culture, them players. Um, you either towed the line and dug in or, or shipped out, basically. And um, I, I don't know if the sport will ever see a group all come through at the same time again like that. that was a, it was like they talk about the Man United class of 92 with, with gigs. And that, yeah. Exactly the same there at Leeds. I don't know if there'll ever be a repeat. I hope there is, and I hope it's all okay in the next few years. Yeah. So do you think that's why that transition a couple of years ago with the fans are so hard? Because they've only ever known success for a long time, haven't they? And if they hadn't won it, they were up there competing, wasn't they? And... Yeah, they all grew. You know, there was all there was all together for so many years. I don't think the club really planned for them to leave because they never knew when they was going to, even when they got old, like, you know, Kev played mid thirties, and Rob and Danny played till it was mid thirties. And you, you can, when do you start to plan? When do you know they're going to go? Like, if they want to play for another year, you're going to give them another year because of how good they are and what they do for the club. So, I think the club at Leeds did struggle for a few years. I think they probably still are. You know, I think they probably yeah. um, exceeded expectations last year, but I think the. They're finding a way to recover. They've got some good people working in their academy now, and they're getting some shoots. And they'll always promote from within with Leeds because that's a yeah. part of that club ethos. Uh, but I don't think any club could have replaced those players uh, and and carried on and made it seamless. Every it was always going to be a it was always going to be a lot of that group left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely, mate. Was it weren't just one or two? It was a full spine and some huge characters, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, some of the legends of Super League, like they weren't even just good players. That there was like Danny Mags is is the, still the top try scorer in Super League history. Like he he'll go down as one of the best standoffs that Leeds have ever had. Kevin Simfield is probably the best player Leeds have ever had. Rob Burrow's not far behind. Um, yeah. Jamie Jones Buchanan played 500, 600 games. Like you just don't replace them easily. You just, you just can't. You can't. It's not even so much what they do on the field. It's, it's who they are and the aura that they have around them. When they're in a, when they're in the room, you know they're in the room and you pay attention to them. And it was always going to be a struggle. Yeah. So how did you find the, the step up in level from academy to, to first team? It, well, it's obviously a mile, miles apart, but back then there was a reserve grade and it was it was strong. It was uh, yeah. uh, it was a really strong reserve league. It was a proper league. Um, the starting to get somewhere like that now, and it's still going to take a few years. But you know, but I remember making my reserves debut uh, playing against Warrington at Wilderspool when I was eighteen. And they had Mark Hilton playing. Um, they had Lee Penny playing. They had uh, Gary Chambers. These these was men. I was a boy. These was these was guys like big, yeah. you know, bald headed Mark Hilton playing in the front row. Like you sank or swam. Like you had to, 
he had to play well, otherwise he'd have ran all over you. This was a proper fella. Um, so yeah, I remember, um, again, I remember that vividly playing in then. And because I stepped up to the reserves, I was playing, I was playing with people like Dean Lawford, who was playing in that game. Francis Cummins in there. He's just like, oh wow, like these are these are these are Super League players. I have to step up. I have to play good. Again, otherwise I'll, I'll just get I'll get cast cast aside and left behind. So, um, so yeah, it was it was huge. But there was a stepping stone towards Super League. It wasn't just academy then, then Super League. I remember a little bit of trivial fact for you. Leeds played St. Helens in the Challenge Cup semi-final at JJB Stadium. It would have been, it would have been two thousand and one, um, and the day before I was sat at home, and Mick Cook rang me, who was the assistant first team coach, and he was our academy coach. I'd never trained with the first team, and he, he rang me and was like, "What? What does he want?" So I, on my house phone, because no one rang on mobile. <laughs> my mind, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he just said, oh, what are you doing tomorrow? So I was like, well, no, why? And he said, well, get yourself over to Wigan. You're playing in the Challenge Cup semi-final. So I was like, oh, shut up, kid. What are you ringing me for? So he said, no, I'm telling you, you need to get to Wigan today because you're playing in the Challenge Cup semi-final tomorrow. Uh, it turns out Leeds had, they'd had a load of injuries that week. You can... They were literally down to bare bones and they needed a back row and they needed a forward and I was playing pretty well for the academy. So I'd never even trained with the first team. I didn't even know any of the players. I had to get my mum's friend because my mum didn't drive. I had to get my mum's friend to drive me to Wigan and uh, all the hotel rooms had gone. So I ended up rooming with with um, Gary, Gary Everington. And that was my debut playing in the Challenge Cup semi-final. Uh, went down the next, I went down on the morning of the game and again, something I'll never forget. Jamie Matthew was there eating his breakfast. Remember Jamie Matthew? Australian football. So he was eating his breakfast and I, I wandered in, didn't know him, didn't know me. And he said, uh, like some bit of small talk. And he said, you better have a fucking good game today because this game's worth a shitload of money to me. And I was like, what an asshole you are. What an absolute asshole you are. I was shitting my pants. I'd not slept a minute. He's Can't that, yeah. No, no, it's something I'll always, always forget. I always remember story. Uh, ultimately, I didn't get on the field, and I was an unused substitute. But I spent probably sixty-five minutes of that game shitting my pants, absolutely bricking it, waiting for the call to come that I was going on. It was only like the last fifteen minutes when I thought, ah, they, they're not putting me on here. Like, I kind of started to relax a little bit. Um. But yeah, for 65 minutes, I was bricking it. It was a game. It was when there was a big brawl. And they had St. Ellen's had a bloke called Peter Shields. I don't know if you remember him. Big tall. Aussie. Yeah. He ended up having a scrap with, I think it was Barry. And, and Barry split him and he cut him right across his eyebrow. And I, The dugouts was both sides of the, of the tunnel. And I was sat right on the edge of the dugout as he ran ran into the changing room to get stitched up. And I saw him and I thought, oh, my God, if I get on today, you're <laughs> going to kick my ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I never get on. So I kind of, it was my debut, but not my playing debut. And then I, um, and then I got to play. My actual Super League debut for Leeds was against, it was against Hull FC at the Boulevard which was very handy because I only lived a couple of hundred metres away from it. Uh, so I had, I literally walked to the ground in the Leeds track. He shit in my pants that I was going to get. Yeah, 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 Leeds track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I made my debut for Leeds against Hull FC. It was on uh, Friday night, Sky TV, and we won. And it was the first time, so I think it was the third time Leeds had beat Hull FC at Boulevard in like 30 years, some stupid, some stupid stat. And we won 15 points to eight. And Danny Ward kicked a drop goal. Front row. Yeah, Danny he didn't Ward. tell me that. <laughs> yeah, he kicked, a, yeah. he kicked a drop goal. Yeah, we won 15 eight, I remember. That was so, my, when, do you know when you're just playing up the road, mate, for like a club such as that? Do, do you realise how far you've come in such a short amount of time? 
yeah, obviously all my mates was there and the family, and I was 18 at the time. Um, so it was a, it was a special moment. I, I remember yesterday I got in trouble because I was warming up, and you, I don't know if you ever went to the Boulevard. It was a it was a rough place. Crowd was not shy. So I was warming up down the sideline and I was getting a load of stick, absolutely ripped to pieces about how shit I was and how they're going to kill me and all the rest of it. I got on the field and we won. So as we're walking off, I started doing all the, you know, the wanker signs and that to, to all the fans and giving them a bit back. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was young and naive. Yeah, I was expecting you banging the badge or something. No, no, I was, I was giving them a little bit of stick as I was walking off and there was a tunnel at the boulevard, it was like a, a steel tunnel cage that you had to walk through, and the fans was either side of it, and there was like they'd be trying to spit at you and all sorts. And I remember getting in the changing room, and and Yistin was just behind me as I was walking in, and he he absolutely ripped into me. He said, "Don't ever do that again." Like, or words to that effect. But he, he you know, he, he piled in onto me. Um, so I never did. But yeah, that's another memory of my debut. Uh, oh, in terms of in terms of recognizing how far yeah how far would come it was it was a, it was a special special moment to have all my family there most of them dressed in black and white for all of C <laughs> but, um, <laughs> actually yeah, trying to spit on you <laughs> <laughs> there was the ones I was doing the sign to <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was um, it was it was a special special day I I made the, it, the same game as the game that Kirk Yeeman made his debut, who we went on to play God knows how many games for LFC, four or five hundred games. And I knew Kirk because he was he was a year younger than me. So I played I played with and against him for the whole school's teams. And we were sat next to each other in the dugout, because the dugouts was joined up back then. Oh right, okay. So he was on the end of his and I was on the end of mine, and we was like looking at each other through the wall and saying, Are you nervous? and having a bit of a giggle to each other. Uh, um, we both got on and you know went on to have decent careers. Like that's a nice memory that made though, isn't it? Because joking aside, with or without the game, friends that you make in the game remain friends all at the time, don't they? So it's a nice little moment that really. Yeah, you, you, all my friends are, are rugby friends. I don't really talk, speak to many people from school anymore, but, yeah. but all my best friends are all are all from rugby. Um, because you share a bond, like you share, you share something that's pretty hard to explain to someone who hasn't experienced it. Um, yeah. there's, there's not many better feelings than, than being in the trenches with each other, and obviously not literally, but like being, you know, in the on the field doing the tough stuff, what training with each other, and experiencing the wins and the losses and the hard times, and it's something that you lot you can always. You, you, if you ever meet up with anyone from years gone who you play rugby with, you always fall straight back into the change room banter and yeah. always fall back into that kind of conversation and then memories start coming flooding back and you spend some special moments with them guys and you just create bonds forever, don't you? Yeah. When you're in and around the players you're around, mate, did you ever feel any, like you were overall, did you, did you know you were good enough? Regardless of the little aspects you touched on before, where you said I wasn't great at this, wasn't great at that. Like we said, the effort brings the talent on, doesn't it? So you obviously earned the right to be there, but it doesn't mean that you were always confident about it. No, no, I wasn't. I, I wasn't at all. I had um, I had a pretty tough time when I left Leeds because of the amount of people that came through Leeds at the same time. There was a bit of a bottleneck at the top, so. There were some really good players, but not everyone could get through. And I was one of those kids that just couldn't make it. I couldn't take the next step to establish myself in that you know world class team. Um, so Tony Smith came in in two thousand four, and I kind of knew that I wasn't going to be there long term. I think I had two years left of my contract, but I knew you know, I was getting old. I think I was twenty. I would have been twenty two at the time, and you just feel you just know that. I could have stayed, but, but when you're not, not getting picked and you're not in the team and you're playing and you're getting put out on loan and things, it was time to go. Um, so that was pretty pretty tough 
to to kind of take that news that you you're not going to play in that team, you're not going to be good enough to to break through into that that team. And then so I left, and then Leeds won won the Super League in two thousand and four. Um, should have stayed for another six months. Might have got myself a trophy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was, I, I had a, I had a pretty tough time that last then the you know the twelve months or so that followed that because I, I went from Leeds, which was the most professional, best run club in the country, to Hull KR, who at that time was not. You know, there was a Championship team. There was a part time team. The, they had a speedway track and a dog track around the pitch. The pitch was well, as big as this laptop. It was, uh, um, it was, it was a tough challenge, tough old challenge. But again, you 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 learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot. But at the time, I probably could have quit the game. But uh, you really felt like that, mate. Yeah. Yeah, I could have. You know, I could have done that. I had a tough. I had a tough year. I was going out on the piss a lot and. Yeah. Um, you know, scrapping and doing doing stuff what I shouldn't have been doing. You know, yeah. It came, it kind of came, it came to a head. We went to we went to we went to Wales um, on a pre-season camp for all care. It was a five-day camp yeah. in Wales, and on the last the last day, they let us have a night out in Cardiff. But I took it far too far, and I went back to the um, hotel, and there was a bit of trouble in the hotel, and the club was effectively going to sack me. Um, but I don't know. So, someone at the time said to me, "Look, you need to get your head sorted. You can have a career in the game, or you can piss off and go and be in prison." And I think that was kind of the slap in the face I needed. So, from that kind of moment on, I just went, "Yeah, get my head down and get back playing." And I did, and the club gave me a second chance. Uh, after I promised them to go on a six-month drinking ban and managed to get back and, and we got the club back to Super League. So, just as you're leaving Leeds, mate, is it, are you someone that, even as a player, because I know your role's changed again, which we'll touch on later on, but was you someone that liked it nice and direct, mate, and honest? Yeah. I always... So the, the people that got the most out of me as a coach was was people like Dean Bell who, who took no shit, um, and Justin Morgan at OKR again. He was another imposing person. He was another tough character. He was, he, you know, he told you what you what you, you what he thought basically, and he he didn't scare around the truth. And that was what I needed. I needed to prove myself to someone. That was what it was. I needed. You know, I needed someone to like me or, or think I was a good player and I think I deserved to be there. And, and they would tell you that and that's probably what me as a character needed as a player. Yeah. So did you, did you when you go to Hull KR, is it about re-establishing yourself and proving to yourself that you can cut it? Because from people I've spoken to in the past, Jace, it's the, the standard is a little bit lower, but it's a different standard, isn't it? It's not your speed, it's about your ability to override toughness and seasoned pros and the dark arts of the intricacies of rugby league, isn't it? Yeah. Being totally honest, at the time I knew I could play, I knew I could handle the level and stuff. Being yeah. completely, completely honest, at that time I wasn't... I, I wanted to come back to Hull because I'd been living in Leeds for a few years, so I wanted to come back to Hull, but I wasn't overly fussed because Leeds didn't want me I wasn't up, I wasn't too bothered where I went. Uh, rugby just yeah. wasn't that important at the time. It was only when I got the kick up the arse where I went, "What am I doing? What am I? Why am I messing up out of this?" Like you, you don't spend ten years working your bollocks off or something, and then and then pack it in just because you can't be bothered. So that was when I went. You know, this club can go somewhere. They're starting to put some money in. They want to get to Super League. Like that's where I want to get back to be playing. So stop. Mm -hmm. that help the team get back to Super League and, and do your bit kind of thing. So it was about raising the standards as well. So Hull KR again at that time wasn't... There was a there was a squad of part-time players. And what happens there is when the players are part-time, they don't want to get to Super League because if they do, they're either going to have to give the job up or the club will get rid of them for full-time players. So there's yeah. no real incentive for them part-time lads 
you know, 27, 28 year old lads to, to get to Super League. The club did a, was really smart and that they invested a lot in young Super League players who would, like myself, who would add some taste of Super League and and then being let go for whatever reason from other clubs. People like Scott Morell, people like Ben Cocaine, John Goddard, who was in the team at the time, Gareth Morton, some young, hungry English lads, Ian Morrison, another one, who had had a taste of Super League and they wanted another crack and they're going to work their ass off to get back there. Um, it was real smart management from the club. They started to invest in the facilities off the pitch. So like I said, they had a dog track and a, and a speedway tracker on the pitch. Well, they got rid of those and, and they you know, made the pitch a decent you know, standard of pitch, normal width and normal size and put some money behind the squad and, and you know, it was all geared up for us to get back to Super League. We just had to do our part, which we did. Yeah. Is there a point in the year where you felt maybe untouchable and unplayable? Because you get them sort of games, Jay, don't you, where you just, you know it's your day, don't you? And everything you touch seems to turn to gold sort of thing. Yeah, that year we got promoted in, in 2006, we went on a 24 match, I think it was 24 match winning streak. Um, so we, we knew, you know, we knew we was good. We knew we could, we could beat any team in there. But the key for us was always having our eye on the end goal. We want to be in Super League. And the way that the competition was, you had to win the last game. You could win 25, 26 games and lose that final and you're not there. You, you, you know, you've lost. So we had to just keep carry on, remain focused on on making sure we won that grand final and got the club where, where we wanted to be. And, um, you know, we did it. We did it with some ease as well, really. Yeah. And how, how was the, the injury list that year? Because you need a bit of luck as well, mate, don't you? You need your, your core group playing week in, week out, really. Yeah, when we did, we, look, we had a, as well as the young, uh, hungry English kids that we got, we, the club had invested in some smart Australian players as well. So they had James Webster, who was outstanding. He, he dragged yeah. us through that league. Uh, they had David Tangasator, who, who was a front rower, and he could play a bit, and he was smart, and he was a hard-working lad. Um, Byron Ford on the wing, who scored about 4,000 tries. He was, again... Wild card off the field, but on the field he could score and try. So we had um, we had a really, really good mix of people at the club. Really, really good mix. And it all just kind of gelled. And we had a fit squad. You know, Jay Webb, James Webster, who was our best player and our maestro and the guy who dragged us around the pitch. He, he was fit all year, never missed a game, I don't think so. Um, him and Scott Morell worked so well that year as a, as a pair of halfbacks. Uh, when you've got your spine injury free all year, you, you can top it up with anyone around them, and that's what we did. We, you know, we had a we had a very very good year that year. We almost to the point where the grand final was a little bit of a anti climax for us. Like, obviously the end goal was amazing and outstanding, but the game itself it just wasn't a spectacle because we always seemed comfortable. It was always yeah kind of comfortable winning the game so that's how I remember it anyway there was there was never a time where we was worried um, we had some decent celebrations afterwards I'll tell you that one <laughs> I can imagine mate so when it comes to the, the big time again and that rolls around mate is, the, is it time for renegotiations and and are you comfortable in yourself now to to lead them or did you have like an advisor or anything like that? Yeah, it, so on that last year, um, I had two contracts offered. So there was a Super League contract and a championship one in case we didn't go up. Obviously, the the, the wage difference was <laughs> was a fair amount and on what yeah. league it was in. So yeah, there's your incentive for, for us financially. Um, but I had a... I had an agent, David House. He was my agent when I was when I was a, when I was younger. He was at Leeds. He's a whole lad, uh, Great Britain manager. He's been in his time and been around the game. So he, he looked after me. He, he had a bit of a soft spot for me. Did did I was in? He did all my all my contracts until I was probably thirty, and then 
you know what your value is and you know what you, you want and you know what you're going to get. I don't think you need one when you get older, but in them kind of mid-20s when, you, when you're when scrapping around for a few more quid and shopping yourself and seeing what your value is on the market and stuff, you probably need one. You probably do, but yeah. Uh, yeah, as you get older, you, you, you know you know what you're worth. So when you when you get back into the big time, mate, has much changed? And, and was the business good from OKR? And how was the feel around the club? <clears throat> yeah, it was it was fantastic. Look, we we did a bit of a different preseason. So was, we went to we went to Torremolinos. We got some new players. We got some. We got Mick Vellerin, who was just tremendous for us. Tremendous. Um, we got some older players who were a bit more established. Some tough, tough blocks in the middle, like Jim Gannon. Uh, we've been around the play, about around the game, and he was a tough fella, and you know, he, he could he could help some of us young English kids out when it got tough. Um, as alongside Mick, who was obviously an international, but we needed to gel and we needed to believe in ourselves a little bit and, and be a group. So pre-season, although it was fairly tough, was not physical. It was more about gelling as a team, and we went to Torremolinos for the preseason camp in January. And the the instructions from the coaching staff was basically as long as you are on the training ground, we don't kind of mind what you do on a night time. Basically, yeah. So it became it became a bit of a lads' holiday. <laughs> like we was out drinking every single night. We we found a bar on the corner, a little little bar and it was one euro a pint and that was when one euro was, one euro was like 30p back then yeah so we as a squad was in there every night um but we became close as a team when you when you're out drinking you're you're fairly honest aren't you so you, you kind of gel yeah. as a group and we went into that season i think we won three out of the first five games we beat leeds we beat wigan beat Wakefield in them first five games and we was top of the league after the first month. Um, we were so close as a group and had so much belief in ourselves and that first night against Wakey uh, at Craven Park under the floodlights is, is just a memory I'll, I'll always have because we, we was underdogs. Two scrappy teams so Wakey have always been a bit of a scrappy team. Not really glamorous but yeah. they fight hard and we was the same and we came out and we won it in the last minute. Benny Cocaine scored under the sticks there, and, and we we won it in the you know, if you've seen the celebrations, we were so ecstatic. Um, give us the confidence to go on and beat we beat Leeds and we beat Wigan as well. So, um, I think after that we we went on a sixteen match losing streak, but we but we started the year. <laughs> <laughs> and then so how? Sorry, mate. Go on. I was going to say then. We we lost a load of games and then we come good at the end again and then we made it actually mathematically impossible for us to be relegated by smashing LFC at, at KC Stadium. Um, we beat them forty two six in the second to last game of the year to to keep us up. It was between us and Salford and we beat Salford the week before and then we went into the whole game and it was you know that's what that's what made us safe. Um, so to do that. At, at Hull FC's home ground and to really, you know, to beat him pretty well was, again, yeah. like the Wakey game was just a, a, such a special time. Like a little grand final really, Jace, isn't it? It's like, it was. It was yeah. uh, It was like our grand final because it, it, it kept us up. It kept us in Super yeah. League for another year. We beat him that well. I remember my dad at the time would not believe me that we, that the, what they had not fixed the game. <laughs> 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 He thought that there'd been some agreement between the two clubs where, <laughs> you know, where LFC had, had thrown the game against us so that we could stay in Super League because it was worth so much money and all that. Yeah. Like, That's yeah. brilliant, that though. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. It was good. So how do, you, how do you learn off the Mick Bellers and the Jim Gannons when times aren't so good? What's, what goes on where you're on, maybe you're under the sticks and you're feeling the heat or... On a Monday in review, or whenever you've done your review, Jace, where was where were the lessons learned for you really when the times were hard? It was just to work hard as a team, just to go back to to being together. Like Mick Mick Vella, he was he was getting towards the back end of his career at the time, but he would always put his hands up to carry the ball. 
regardless of how tired he was or where he was. He was he just led through actions. Uh, he didn't speak much, probably because he was in the middle of the field and couldn't breathe. But <laughs> seriously, though, but he yeah. he would carry the ball. He would turn up time and time again. Uh, he would do the tough stuff. He'd, ex- he'd experienced it. So because he had that experience and he did the hard work, people listened automatically. Um, there, he was a leader through actions and not not so much words. I'm going to uh, say that his actions were doing the talking by the sounds yeah. of things. And he, and he was a, absolutely a diamond of a bloke off the field. Like he was such a prankster. Like he was the guy who would cut the ends of your socks off and shaving foam in the trainers and all, all kinds of mm. stuff. He'd, he'd be the one that would that would get the club going and get the team going. And he was, uh, yeah, he was like the kind of, the guy that gelled the team together. It was, it was, yeah, it was a special time at the time. Yeah. And with not knowing it, mate, are you picking up little attributes from the likes of Leeds, from OKR, to sort of shaping it into seeing talent and, and knowing what bits of talent can get you places and what bits of attitude can't. Are you, are you picking that up, do you think? Even at that age, yeah, I think so. You know what, you know what hard work looks like. Mm. So many, there's so many players that I've seen come into the game who were so many, so much more talented than I ever was, but they they don't last because they're not prepared to do the things that others are prepared to do. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, and that's what and that's what I stand out like a sore thumb. Sorry, that some of it sometimes it does, sometimes yeah. it does. and so many talented players just won't push themselves beyond that hard work. Um, they won't they won't take themselves into some dark places when they need to. It's the talent will only get you so far, you know, like we've said already a few times tonight. Without that graft and without that attitude of, of really digging in, your teammates won't respect you. And if you lose the respect of your teammates, you you're gone, you're out of there. Yeah, um, the teammates. When I was playing, would always respect someone who worked hard. Even if you're not the best player, as long as you're trying, then they'll forgive anything that you, any mistakes that you make, because they don't yeah. work hard to rectify it. <clears throat> so. The, the, the spelling of mate, so when did the, the end of the first spell to KR, how did that come about and, and why why was Australia an option and how does that come about? So I'd been at Rovers for, for I think it was nine years. I'd been there for nine years. It's coming, I, was, I was just getting into my 30s, uh, 31, and I knew the end was coming at some point. But I had no, yeah. like I said, I didn't, I didn't try out at school. I had absolutely zero qualifications. Um, I had nothing to fall back on. I had two years left in my contract. Craig Sandercock came and we just did not, we didn't click, we didn't get on. He didn't like me, I didn't like him. Um, so I was I was doing a gym session one day with Joel Clinton, who was, our, was an Australian. He was my gym partner and was doing our gym session and I knew he was going to be leaving at the end of the year anyway. So I was just asking, I said, oh, wait, you know, we got all lined up for next year. And he, he said, oh, yeah, he's going to a club in a club called Mackay in the Queensland Cup. Um, and there was giving him you know, a certain amount of money, but there was also putting him through an apprenticeship, uh, engineering apprenticeship, so he can go down in the mines and, and work. So it sounded great because you get you obviously getting educated, you get an apprenticeship where you're getting paid a lot of money as well. So I said, you know, I said, oh, that sounds brilliant. That I've always loved to go to Australia. Like I've been a few times. He said, oh, if you want, I'll speak to the CEO and see if he's interested in getting you down. I said, yeah, do it. And then I got an email off the CEO of the club a few days later. Kind of went from there, really. Um, and then the so the club agreed to release me. And then assigned to go there for a year, so I went. Uh, I went down there. I think it was in the January. It went in there, yeah, just after Christmas in the January. Uh, 
with a bit of pre-season, but I, I, in the first trial game that they've got there, I dislocated my shoulder, so I was injured. It took me it took me a while to get back, and my wife, who was my wife at the time, she she had ended up refusing to come. She didn't want to, and we had a two-year-old. So, you know, once she'd said she didn't want to go, it was, you know, I got the plane. I got booked the plane for the next week. Um, the idea was I was going to go for a few months, get settled, get as a house and get everything ready. And then she'd come down, but she didn't want to go, which I completely understood. It's a big, big move. Um, so, yeah, I just jumped. I jumped on a plane and, you know, and I came back and I, I literally, I just landed and got in. I was driving on the way home from Manchester Airport and um, Neil or Joe rang me. Said what you what you doing? No, you're back. I said, oh no, but not planned. I didn't have anything set up or anything. And he said, oh, meet me tomorrow. And I went and met him and then signed a new contract at OK. I went back there. So just before we talk about your second spell, then, mate, how would you been with injuries, Jace? Yeah, I'd not I'd not been too bad. Uh, I well I say not been too bad. I dislocated my shoulder twice. My left, dish, my left shoulder. Mm. Other than that, I'd, I'd, I'd not had any knee injuries, which is something I never had in my career, luckily. Um, I, you know, a few little niggles, you know, broken thumb, yeah. just a couple of pulled muscles and stuff, but no, nothing too serious. I managed to escape them, just just the, just the shoulders, a couple of shoulders. Um, so, fairly clean bill of health, really. Yeah, no, you... No. You want them to do yourself and work hard so it, it reaps its rewards in the end, mate, doesn't it? I'd like to think so. You look, look after yourself, don't you, and, and do the best you yeah. can. Um, some people do that and they still get bad luck. So, yeah, it's a difficult one injury, isn't it? Some of them just can't be helped. You know, some people, do. Uh, I was very lucky not to have any knee injuries. I'm one of the few that come out of the game without any, any knee injuries. Um, took a few bad head knocks, which I'm sure will catch up with me at some point in later life. But uh yeah, it's probably another another story. And uh what what would you like about uh, the sentimental stuff so the memorabilia and like did you did your mum collect the newspaper cuttings and stuff like that? A little scrapbook. Yeah oh, mate it's a, it's a touchy one with my sister that one. So right. <laughs> don't want to kick him off right <laughs> but she calls me golden child because my mother my mother collected everything, like yeah. every every single newspaper clipping. Uh, she's got bloody twenty four VHS videos of me playing and CDs, and she's got them all. You know, she had them in a big box. And then a few years ago, she was like, "I, I, I don't want them anymore. Like I, I can't do that with them. You have them. Give them to the girls. I've got two daughters." I'm like, yeah. "They don't want them. They're not going to want them." When you know when I'm long gone, they're not going. Who looks through it all? Um, so she said, "Well, you're going to have to have it. Put it in your shed." So she brought them. She brought them around me, and obviously, it's like four big, massive boxes. <laughs> my sister was blast that though. Yeah, oh, it's brilliant. Honestly, it's, I've got yeah. them. Um, was it a video player in there, Jess? For the for the videos or what? Was it what? Was there like a video player in there or was it an eBay no, job? No, 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 no video. <laughs> I'm going to have to, uh, I keep thinking or saying I'm going to go and get them converted into CDs. Yeah. Um, but I probably never will. But during lockdown, actually, my missus was 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 having clear out and all that. She was like, what are you going to do with all this stuff? I said, I think I'll just throw it away. She went, no, don't throw it away. She said, why don't you build, turn, turn the shed into a bar? And put it have like a memorabilia wall and all that stuff. So I've done that. I built it's a bar awesome. in the garden and I put all my shit up on the wall. Yeah, because I used to it's give awesome. my mum like every single plane shit that I had, I give it to my mother at the end of every year. So yeah. I've got all them and they're all on the they're all on the ceiling and I've got my trophies in a little cabinet that I built and all yeah, it's it's, it's good. But yeah, my, my sister goes mad. Golden <laughs> So what what would they what would they talk? For okay, I had to persuade you to go back, mate. After a little bit, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but maybe a bit of a, a sour, a sour note to leave on with maybe not being too civil with a coach and that. Is it everything's repairable, I suppose, mate, isn't it? Under the right circumstances, yeah. I didn't get on with the coach, 
you know, he was he was a fantastic coach, but his man management wasn't great. Um, but I knew the chairman. I knew Neil for years and years, over since I first went there, and I had a good relationship with Neil. Um, and he just, yeah, he just said, "Come and meet me tomorrow." I met when I met him. We didn't really talk about money. He just said, "Are you coming back?" Basically, yeah. I met with a coach the following the following day or a couple of days after, and we both just said, "Look, you don't like me. I don't like you, but we've got a job to do." Kind of thing. Um, yeah. Get your head down, work hard, and see if you can get yourself back in the team and get fit again. And um, it, was, it was quite ironic, really, because he didn't he didn't like me, so he didn't pick me, and. Uh, He'd do anything he could not to pick me really at the start, and then by the time his time at the club had finished, he was begging me to play because because I was I was playing well. I probably the last year of my career was probably my best year, um, certainly five or six years previous. But I found it quite ironic that he got to the point where he was telling me I didn't even have to train; I just I could play if I wanted to. Shock off. And then two years before that, he, he wouldn't even pick me regardless of how well I was training. So it was like, I won that one. <laughs> little small victory. No. And it's mad because earlier on in your career, you needed that, that arm around you to say, yeah, you, you're my type of player, Jason. Yeah, later on in the career, maybe maybe you reinvigorated something in you. Yeah. With, with the dislike, maybe. It pr- probably. Fire in the belly. Um, mm. But I always had the backing of my teammates. So my, even my teammates would be going into the office and saying, "What? Why are you picking him? What? What are you doing? He needs to be in the team, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So once you know you've got the backing of them, you kind of you feel a little bit more freedom. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably how I felt. And again, because I knew the end of the career was coming, you, you play with a little bit more freedom anyway because things don't matter. So you're not you're not playing for a contract. You're not fighting for what's coming next. You. You're enjoying what you've got left. Um, so I probably could have played another year in the end, but I was real happy with the year that I had when I went out because I enjoyed myself. Um, and you won't. It's want nice to, to know you finish on your own terms as well, mate, isn't it? That's a very different scenario as well. Yeah, it was. It was. I had, I had a bad back injury, not injury, but I had a bad back. I've got got a couple of bad discs and. The last year, I couldn't do much running, so I'd end up sitting on the sideline on a on a what bike and watching the lads train in the early part of the week, and you start feeling guilty. You know they're they're doing the hard work, and you're sat pedaling, turning a bike over like it's not the same. So it was the right time for me to go. Uh, the club had some young kids coming through; they needed to invest some more some money in them. It would have been if I was a Jamie Peacock type player who was inspirational and amazing. You, you might say, "Okay, well, don't train, but you can play." But I wasn't. Yeah. You know, they could give my money to someone else who is going to train and who is going to kind of earn that spot in the team. So it was the it was the right time. But again, like Leeds when they won the they won the um, Super League when I left. Okay, I got to the Challenge Cup final on the year that I left as well. So I probably should have. Probably should have played another year. Oh, no. Sat on the what bike for a bit longer. <laughs> Could have played at Wembley. Mind you, they got beat 50 nil. So yeah, that's the thing, and it makes finding the balance. So did did you did you have a role to go into when you made that decision? I was, um, or was... the cho- the choice I had was you can play another year. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a contract there if you want it, or there's a job in the youth development department. Which had just come. Sean Briscoe had the job, and he was he was leaving to go back to Warrington. Yeah. So the choices are: you can play another year, but this job might not be there for you in a year's time, or you can finish your playing career and step into this job now. Um, bear in mind what we spoke about: the fact I had zero education. The the safe bet for me, or the probably or the right thing to do, <laughs> quit playing and go and get going into that job and you know, see where you go with that. So yeah. that was the, decision. The, the the money was the same, so it wasn't like I was taking a massive pay cut. It was the same, um, same wage. So it was just like, yeah, I'll just step into that now and finish playing. I, I can't run anyway, so yeah, you know, I'll go into that and, and see where that takes you. So how was it going in and seeing things from the other side of the line, mate? And 
is it about reintroducing yourself to people as as something new? And and how was that for you? It was it was strange. I'd never had a job. Never had a nine to five job. I I'd st- I left school and went straight to Leeds and became full time. And I always had a full time career, so I had never I'd never had a what you'd call a proper job. So I didn't know what to do. Um, so it took me quite a while to get used to it. Like I, I'd sit in the office just not doing anything. I'd put my feet on the desk. And I remember my first day, my first day, there was three of us in that department. So they said, oh, come on, we'll go, we'll go for lunch. Uh, we'll go and get a carvery lunch. So we went to this pub and there was joking on the way down saying, oh, we'll have a liquid lunch. They was joking. I thought they were serious. So I've gone, I've gone into this pub. <laughs> And I've gone up to the bar and I ordered a pint of, of Carlin or whatever it was. Uh, and them two were like, what are you doing? I said, we're having a liquid lunch, are we? And they'd ordered uh, orange cordials. I said, no, you don't do it. You're <laughs> going to go back to work in an hour. Well, I thought that's what people do. That's what they do in Emmerdale and Coronation Street. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they do to people now, don't they? <laughs> they do, yeah. And yeah. That's, all I, that's all I do about work, like... I yeah. thought I was going, going to go have three or four pints up on my lunch and then go back to the office. <laughs> um, but yeah, apparently you don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you're out on the field, mate, shaping that next generation, what is it you look for in a young a young player when maybe you've sent your scouts out to club games and they come feedback? What are the key areas you look for in, in a young player? Good person. Like a good, a good bloke or a good kid, um, like, you know. Even if you work hard, if you're if you're a dick, people won't like you. Yeah. Um, so you got to be a good. You got to be a good kid first and foremost, and then you got to work hard. You got to you got to love what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing, you're not going to do it to the best of your ability. And if you're not doing it to the best of your ability, why are you even doing it? So. For me, it's been it's been a good person, and then being one that's going to really really work hard. Like like I said to you earlier, work hard and see where that takes you. If you don't get through, because I think this, that's that that's only two percent of kids that that go into a scholarship end up having a career. That's you know two out of a hundred. Your chances are very very minimal. Yeah. So you might as well have a try. You might as well give it all you've got. And then if you walk away, at least you can say you've done your best. Yeah. So I'll always say, graft, 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 dad. If you do walk away, mate, you go back to your community club, twice the player, twice the person. So you're yeah, only yeah. going to enhance that club anyway, aren't you? And exactly. Who so, knows further down the track then? Go and, be a, go and be a good bloke. Go and play community rugby. Go and enjoy. Some people do that anyway. Some people work really yeah. hard. But they find that it's, it's too hard for them, that the environment... But, they come from the community game where um, they're probably the best in the team and, and they don't even need to turn up training. The coach will pick them on a weekend. So suddenly an environment where they have to work hard, it's hard. We, we, you know, we give them some hard sessions and um, some of them just don't want to do it. They, they go, oh, this is not for me. This is this is very, very hard. This is And there's no shame in that. No, not at all. Go back, go back to your community club and enjoy your rugby. And some of them just want to have a beer with the mates on a Saturday after a game. And that's fine. There's, there's no issue with that. Go and do that. Um, we're in the business of making professional players, though, so you've got to work hard if you're in our, our environment. Yeah. And how is it when kids come and they, they maybe think they're a big fish in a little pond and did he, did he understand that a lot of you have been there and done that, you know, how they're feeling? Did he reach out in certain ways that maybe your generation might not have? Uh, they get weeded out pretty quick, I think. They get, yeah. you know, they, they get Some of them do come in into the academy as, uh, you know, their attitudes are fantastic, but the older lads will just weed them out. They'll just suss them out straight away. And... Um, Bit like first team level. If you're not, if you're not a good bloke, if you think you're better than you are, you, you lose the respect to your teammates. Once that's lost, it's very, very hard to get it back. 
very hard it's because hard. you form opinions and it's hard to change our opinions. So they don't last very long. They don't tend to not last very long. I've seen many, many come and go. Um, That's the beauty of sport, I suppose, mate, isn't it? You do get found out, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for the environment, yeah. unfortunately for the individual, isn't it? Yeah, they do. But on the on the flip side, I just I've met so many fantastic lads, fantastic lads that that go on to be successful, regardless of what career they end up with, whether it's rugby yeah. league or, or fire service or police or working on the docks. You know, they're going to do the best because I think what our game gives you is that is that ethos of hard work because you have to. So. If you can do that, you're going to be successful in whatever career path you have. That's what I always try and tell the lads. There's so many transferable skills from rugby league into the, the general working environment anyway. Um, and that's what we encourage our lads to do. Because like I said, there's, there's, the stats are telling you that there's a fair chance you're not going to get a career. You're not going to have a, you're not going to have a 200, 300 game career in the sport. What are you going to do? You know, what, what are you going to do when that doesn't work out for you? Get yourself an education, make sure you're a good person, you've got a good work ethic. That's it, you're not selling them away then, mate, are you? are just giving them the best platform to thrive in yeah. whatever environment you, you end up being involved in. The the help that these lads get nowadays is so much more than we got back then. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a we have a full-time welfare officer whose sole job is to look after the players' welfare, check that everything's okay in schools, in college, at work. Um, if they've got any issues, mental issues or anything, they go and, and speak to her. And She's outstanding. Um, the coaching staff, you know, there's, there's four of us, like, there's more coaches than we probably need, but, but we have them because, because of what they bring to the club and full-time physios, full-time conditioning staff for academy is, uh, is crazy. So, the resources available to lads nowadays, there, there really is no excuse for not trying hard. It's um, purely attitude, isn't it, now? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we've we've come to the party in our bit now. You've got to do the same. Look, I can't speak highly enough for the group that we've got at at the moment. They're brilliant. They really, really are brilliant. Um, hasn't always been the case, but we've got, we've worked hard to get this group together and got some pretty high hopes for them, to be honest. My God. So how are you, the chaps, being on the other side? So do you know them couple of chaps you've had where you've, you've disagreed or you've ended up mutually leaving a club in the end? How are them chats to have when you're the one invite, initiating that conversation? The, to be fair, they're pretty easy because the yeah. players already know. So you're not telling them anything they don't know. If, if I tell you that you're not working hard enough and you're going to have to leave, you will already know that you're not working hard enough. You know, if I tell you your attitude's wrong, the chances are you already know that. I'm not. I'm not giving you any information that you already don't have access to, like because there's a there's a build up before that point. If if you're if you're being disruptive to the group, there's a fair chance that we're gonna have set a, a few conversations before we get to the end point. So um, that end point is not. It's not new. You already know about it. Um, yeah. And then conversations that they're not nice to have with young lads, but they're necessary because you, you've got to look at the whole group rather than one individual. Um, yeah. It's the same when you're picking a team, when, you, when you're telling people whether they're playing or they're not playing it. They're, they're, not, they're not that nice to have, but they're necessary because you want that player to get better. So you have to give him the feedback that he deserves, um, yeah. whether he's playing or he isn't playing. So, yeah, I've got a good group of staff there that help me out with them conversations, but ultimately they're there to be had, and that's just part of the job. Oh, mate, and I appreciate your time. So we'll we'll have some daft questions if that's all right, mate. Yeah, so any pre-match superstitions when you were playing? Uh, I used to have... Not daft ones, but I had a routine of, yeah. of you know when I put the sock on and when I put the other sock on. I, I give another little bit of interesting trivia. It's not interesting, but it's weird. I played in the same pair of trunks 
for every single game I ever played him from being under 18 to to finishing my career. Speedos. That's a great effort. Yeah, yeah, they didn't wear out or anything. Yeah. I mean, there might be there might be a few stains in there, <laughs> <laughs> especially when you were on the bench in that semi-final, mate. <laughs> yeah, the same, I had the same pair of black speedos for every game from when I was eighteen onwards. Brilliant. So you'd have probably been a big fan of the Bugsy when you were playing them, mate, weren't you? Yeah. Well, these was these was yeah. black speedos. Yeah. Yeah. You were posh having speedos. Well, I'll tell you why I had them because I hated them. When I got on, but I went, I taught Australia with England Academy, Great Britain Academy. Um, and Mike Gregory was our coach. And he'd said, as part of the part of the build up to us going, that obviously we'd be doing a lot of rehab after games and a lot of it be swimming and you have to have trunks. You can't go in short. Yeah. So my, my mum made me buy them speedos. So I thought, well, I'm never going to wear them. A normal swimming in a normal public swimming pool. I'll just wear them for games, and that's how it came about. That's yeah. enough, mate. So again, the, the the word I'll use next, mate. The definition's different for everybody, but the yeah. toughest player you played with and against. So, oh, toughest player I've played against would be be a few. Can you say more than one? Oh, she can, mate. Yeah. I remember playing Paul Schoolthorpe for St. Helens. That was dreadful. Uh, Andy Farrell, I played against him when he was at Wigan. And then I remember playing against David Ferner when he was at Wigan and he absolutely folded me in half. Um, so there was, you know, there was tough players. Kenny Cunningham, a tough player. Yeah. Tough place, toughest player played with. Again, it's certain criteria. So Rob, Rob Burrow, tough player. Put his mm. body on the line for someone so small. Um, then you've got your, your proper tough players like your Barry Max, Barry McDermott. I think Scott Morell would be up there. He, he put himself in front of people that he should never have put himself in front of. So, yeah, they're, they're you know, the three that stand out there. Right, so your favourite away ground? Ooh. Controversial. And do you like do you like the older ones or the newer ones, mate? I like um, I like the KC Stadium. Yeah, which won't go down well with all KR fans. <laughs> Simply because every time I played there, it was full. So yeah. obviously it was a derby, and there'd be twenty odd thousand people there. So the atmosphere was always electric, and all KR was always given the behind the posts side. Um, they'd fill that up, and they'd, they'd be so loud that. Well and truly out sing the LFC fans. So um definitely the KC would be my favourite away ground. Uh Headingley playing in front of that south stand under the floodlights on a Friday night would be outstanding. There's you know a bit of a contradiction there with the new and the old. Um Headingley's really popular, mate. Yeah, that south stand when it's full on a Friday night, the stand you know, the crowd singing, marching on together and and I'll look, I'm lucky that I've done it on both sides for Leeds and against Leeds. So that'd be um, that'd be up there without a shadow of a doubt. And I've not asked you, so I don't know why, but how did you find a build up to a derby being whole lad? Uh nervous, nerve wracking. You know, I, I I got I got so wound up to them games and um Living in Hull, there's, there's a build-up for a couple of weeks beforehand, so you can't escape it. You can't get away from it. I was, again, fortunate enough to play in a, in a team where we, we dominated them derbies. We won far more than we lost, so we fed off the news. We fed off, off the build-up because we was always the... We was always billed as the, you know, the little brother and the noisy neighbour and the small club against the big club, etc. So we we loved that. We we'd put them printouts up on the walls and changing rooms, and you know we'd be we'd be talking about it before games in the build up about things that they had said in the newspaper and that. So that got us going. Um, worst place in the world when you lose a derby, though. Oh, I can imagine that. That would uh, that would have an effect for quite a while. Hey mate, so if you you've been out and had a few with the bars and the microphones in your hands, what are you giving us on the karaoke? Yeah. Uh Penny Arcade. Yeah. 
don't mind a bit of penny arcade every now and then. Um, bit of gold. The old ones are the best. <laughs> are you going to give us a shuffle or just blast it out? <laughs> I'll blast it out. I'll blast it a little one too, sir. No, I mean, I'd go full, full hog. Yeah, get the crowd involved and everything. <laughs> yeah. So if you could go back and tell a younger you something from what you've learned, mate, what would it be? Uh, oh. Go to school. Go to sc- oh, I enjoy school. You know, put the effort into yeah. school work as much as rugby because it was very scary for me towards the end of my career knowing that I hadn't, I had nothing to fall back on. I had no education. I had no job, no real prospects. I was fortunate that I fell into this job or a job straight away. But if I hadn't have done, I don't know what I would have done. I didn't earn enough money playing to be able to retire or live off that. So I would yeah. go back and I'd tell I'll tell the arrogant Jason in school who thought he was going to be a Super League player that that might not happen and you've got to graft your backside off in your exams and do your best. That's fair enough, mate. And if you're willing to, a 1-13 to that you played with, if that's okay. 1-13 to that I played with? Yeah. I'd say I'd go Sean Briscoe. Yeah. Full back, I really enjoyed playing with, with Sean. Uh I'd go Peter Fox on one wing. Yeah. Jake Webster, Chris Wellham. Oh, on the other wing, I'd go Daniel Fitzhenry. I'd go Blake Green and Michael Dobson. These are all Hulk the shit part, isn't it? Yeah, it was brilliant. Uh, these are all whole KR players. I, I could talk about the Leeds yeah. ones, but I didn't play enough with them. Yeah, not a professional, Super League level. Yeah. And, um, I'd go Mickey Vella, Josh Hodgson. Um, I'll come back to 10. I'd go Clint Newton. Hey. Yeah. And from Raw. And then? No, Clint Newton would be number 11. I'd yeah. come back to number 10. Benny Glea, number 12. 13. Whoa. Probably Reese Lovegrove. No, no, Scott Morell still is. Scott Morell. I put Reese in at number 10. Yeah. 